I'm Joel McCower, Executive Editor at GreenBiz Group. I'm here talking to Jim Fitterling, the CEO of Dow. Uh, Jim, it's great to see you again. Great to see you, Joel. First of all, how's everything in Midland right now? Uh, what's going on with uh, the recovery and, and what's Dow's role in that? From a, from a Dow perspective, everything is back to normal. Uh, we're operating 100% here in Midland and all the partners in the iPark are operating as well. From a community perspective, it's a little bit different. I was uh, just out this morning uh, volunteering in Sanford, which is a small town, was just below the Sanford Dam, which was the lower dam of the two that collapsed. And um, there's a lot of destruction there. There's many, many people still without homes. uh, And uh, we were distributing relief supplies and, and other things to them. So there's a lot of reconstruction to be done. I would say the the cleanup and that part of the recovery is underway. Uh, the reconstruction part will will just be getting started here soon. Okay, well, lots to do. But meanwhile, Dow has just made some uh, some commitments, and I want to talk about those. First of all, the company has committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. Can you explain a little bit about what that means and and what it will take for Dow to get there? Sure. So we we actually made three new sustainability commitments, one around protecting the climate, one around stopping waste, and one around closing the loop, uh, creating a circular economy. On protecting the climate, we said by 2050 that we would be carbon neutral. And that includes looking at scope one through three emissions and also taking a look at the positive benefits that some of our products bring to society uh, things like, um, you know, benefits of uh, energy efficient housing and, and the re- reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that that creates as well. Um, but that's a that's a big step change. And when you think about our history, for 30 years, we've been working on environment, health and safety and sustainability goals. So we're on our third decade of doing this. From 2006 to 2015, we were able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by uh, almost 20%, which was a very substantial reduction. We think we can do that again by 2030. Uh, That will take us another 15% reduction by 2030. Um, And then these goals would take us to carbon neutrality by 2050, which is in line uh, with the Paris Treaty. So just to be clear, uh, some of the carbon neutrality will come from reductions in the emissions that Dow is is creating uh, in the environment. And some of that will be, uh, some of those emissions will be offset uh, by uh, some of the, the positive benefits of, of Dow's products. So is that correct? And if so, do you have a system for accounting for all of that? that that's correct, Joel. And one of the things that we're working on right now uh, is working with partners and, and putting together a consortium that is going to help us come up with an index that is uh, measurable and uh, accountable so that there there can be some verification for that and some justification for that. Um, I'd say the large part of it is still going to be scope one through three uh, emissions, which are, are the bulk of what everyone considers as part of the reduction but we do make a lot of products that do create a very positive impact to society. And, and up till now, there hasn't been a real good way to account for that. And, and we've got to come up with a, a verifiable index to account for that. And just for people who aren't necessarily schooled in this, scope one, two, and three refers to the different ways that uh, a company uh, creates emissions. One is through its direct operations. One is through the, like, the energy that it purchases. And one is through the supply chain, which I'm sure for, for many companies, uh, and I'm sure for Dow as well, a lot of the impacts come from there. So, so let's talk about the second uh, commitment that you're making around enabling, and that's your word, a key word there that I want to ask you about, enabling 1 million metric tons of plastic to be collected, reused, or recycled through both direct actions and partnerships. Explain a little bit about how that works. What does it mean to enable? So think about um, one one of the initiatives that we've been part of is, for example, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, uh, which is working on uh, waste management infrastructure and recycling uh, and and being able to stop waste from going into oceans and into waterways and out to the ocean. Um, We've also been working with groups like um, 
uh, closed loop partners, uh, circulate capital in terms of enabling projects that can allow that waste to be minimized. And we've also worked with World Economic Forum on their Global Plastics Action Partnership. So it's not uh, as indirect as it sounds. It's actually us working through other agencies to put projects in place where we can account for the amount of waste that has been stopped or, or, or kept from going out into the environment. And uh, we're also looking at things that we can do on reuse of plastics that would stop them from going not just into waterways, but stop them from going to landfills. Uh, so we're, we're looking at both of those scopes as part of that metric. Um, that is one, you know, we, we believe, and I, and I think you and I have talked about this before, plastics are an important part of a circular economy and a low carbon future because they do drive a lot of sustainability benefits in our world. Um, the plastic waste issue, though, is one that has to be tackled. And so we've got to come up with ways to implement uh, projects, both recycling and infrastructure projects, that can stop that waste from being uh, just one use and then out to a landfill or one use and then ending up in the environment. As part of that commitment, uh, your DAO is saying that it's going to invest in key technologies and infrastructure. Can you, can you give an example of the kind of, uh, of technology that, that needs investment? Well, we need, to, we need technologies that can, uh, for closing the loop, we need technologies that can take plastics and recycle them back to plastics again for mechanical recycling. We need technologies that can take them and recycle them back to a feedstock, so an advanced recycling technology. Uh, there are many applications today for uh, mechanical, mechanically recycled plastics, but there are some limitations in terms of use for mechanically recycled plastics. And going to advanced recycling allows you to take it back to more of a neat form of a feedstock and then plastics again. And that, that would allow you to get into applications maybe like food packaging applications again. Uh, so we're looking at both of those. We're looking at uh, the use of materi different materials for production of plastics. So we're working with a company called UPM Biofuels, which actually takes a, a wood-derived product and makes a naphtha out of it and converts that into plastics. Uh, so we're looking at a lot of different technologies that go into it. Um, and then we're looking at technologies as well that touch the carbon part of the equation, the emissions part of the equation, like our uh, FCDH technology, which is in pilot stage right now. Uh, FCDH produces on-purpose propylene from propane, but it does so uh, at a 20% lower greenhouse gas emissions uh, than its next best available alternative. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big step change in, in production of propylene, and propylene for polypropylene or polyurethanes is a widely used uh, raw material. If we can also extend that technology uh, into the production of ethylene, uh, then you've got the two biggest monomers in our industry, ethylene and propylene, we believe we can make ethylene with an almost a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. That's a very big change. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so doing both of those things as well helps us on the plastics, but also on the greenhouse gas emissions side. And, and our view is, you know, plastics, low carbon economy, low greenhouse gas emissions go hand in hand. There's a symbiotic relationship, plastics by their own nature make things lighter weight, they make things more energy efficient, they make cars lighter weight, more fuel efficient, even even more fuel efficient if they're electric vehicles. And then if you can get the reuse part of that into the equation, you've you know, created a, a big opportunity for a win on both the greenhouse gas and the circular economy part of the, pro, uh, part of the equation. Well, let's talk about the reuse part because that goes to your third commitment, which is around to have 100% of your products sold into a, a packaging that's reusable or recyclable by 2035. I, I would imagine that reuse for the kinds of products that Dow makes is, is kind of a tough challenge. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Dow makes a lot of products in packaging that go into uh, film applications, flexible film applications for food packaging. 
And we we do make some in rigid applications as well, but probably the toughest uh, recycle challenge is in flexible food applications. And and one of the reasons it is is because to make those structures uh, for many years, it has been uh, development of different layers of technology that are put together to make that structure. But what ends up happening is that makes a complex structure that's hard to recycle. You can do some things with recycling with a complex structure like that using compatibilizers. So when you break it down, you can put a compatibilizer with it and, and allow it to be recycled with other materials. But it isn't as efficient as if we were be able to be able to design from the beginning a, a more homogeneous type polymer that would be able to provide all the characteristics you would need for a flexible food package. Maybe it, it could be a, a vegetable package that goes from your freezer to your microwave or a cereal package that uh, you might buy on the shelf that has a, a zipper top on it. If you could make that all out of a homogenous polymer, then you could easily take that product and put it in a recycle bin and have that recycled. Today, most recyclers won't take a film product. They'll take a rigid product, but most of your film products end up going into waste. And our view is there's a lot of value out there today. If you looked at the whole plastic waste issue, in our estimation, there's 80 to $120 billion of raw material value there that could be used uh, instead of you know, going to get virgin feedstock materials. We could use that material as feedstock to make next generation materials. So we're working on design for recyclability as a big part of it. And then the other part is recycling and compatibilizing with other materials. Uh, earlier this year, last year, we launched a, a product in low density uh, film range. And low density film for viewers that might be watching, if you were to go pick up um, a case of bottled water or something that has a stretch outer layer around it, that's typically low density film. We have a product today that has as much as 70% recycled content in it. So that resin can be used by a film producer to produce a product with as much as 70% recycled content. So if we, we look at both of those avenues, uh, we believe that we can make a substantial change in closing the loop and designing for a circular economy. So at the same time that you're making these three new commitments, you're still working on your 2025 commitments that, that, that you promulgated, I think, probably five years ago. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you are five years out, where you are in that journey to meet your 2025 sustainability goals? We've, we've made some substantial progress. So one, of, one of the key goals on 2025 was around the use of alternative energy. So it was driving toward that protect the climate goal. And we had a goal of uh, up to 750, mil, uh, 750 megawatts of alternative energy used for our own power consumption. Uh, today, we announced four new renewable projects, which uh, are in the United States and Brazil, uh, which together are more than 340 megawatts of, of power for our own consumption. That's going to take us well north of uh, 550 megawatts uh, of that goal already. So we we believe that we're going to exceed that 750 megawatt goal that we set for ourselves. Uh, we made substantial progress on water. Uh, so water was one of the other areas uh, where we're actually trying to close the loop on water and, and do more recycling. And we've got several facilities that have made substantial improvements there. One of our flagship facilities in the Netherlands, in Ternusen, is probably one of the, the most advanced in their water reuse and recycle. And they have a very symbiotic partnership uh, there with also the local community. So making sure that they're reusing processed water for applications so they take uh, pressure off of the fresh water sources for the local community. So between our industry and neighboring industries in the local community, we work together on targets like that. And then on environment, health, and safety, we're doing a lot uh, in terms of eliminating risks for our employees. We've used a lot of drone and robotic technologies. We do about 10,000 confined space entries with our people every year. Um, this past year, we eliminated almost 750,000 hours of confined space entry time. So that's that's time where we did not have to send people inside 
a vessel, uh, which in a confined space is a risky environment. We're able to do that all with robots and drones. And our manufacturing team uh, strongly believes that they'll be able to get to a future where almost 100% of confined space entries, underwater uh, types of uh, uh, investigations uh, will be able to be done with uh, technology, robots, drones, submersibles. And uh, we're seeing that in real time right now. So before I let you go, talk a little bit about the impact that these new commitments are going to have on Dow's shareholders, employees, and customers. As, as I talk to investors, um, they're all concerned about this. So they're, uh, you know, everybody, everybody lives in the same world and, and, and we all want to have a, a future that's bright for ourselves and for future generations. So they ask about this all the time. Uh, and they also ask about the, the kind of money that we're putting toward it. And they want to understand how it's measured. They want to understand uh, how realistic it is to achieve. They also want to understand if it's if it's going to be economical, affordable, uh, because that's a part of sustainability as well. We have to be able to financially be able to support it. Um, but I think they're all very positive when we talk to them about what we're doing, and they want to see us be out on the leading edge. You know, at the end of the day, our industry is a science and technology industry. We are part of the solution. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times people view us as part of the problem, but realistically, we've always been part of the solution in terms of moving forward to better technology and better capabilities. And I think this is another challenge for us. And uh, honestly, our people are very energized by this. Today, I, I hardly have a capital project that does not have a sustainability uh, bent to it. And when you look at new product innovations, I would venture to say nine out of every 10 new product innovations has a sustainability driver to it. I, in, you know, in the time that I'm CEO of Dow, I, I would imagine almost every product that we innovate for somebody is going to be a sustainability driven project. And today, one of the metrics that we have in place is making sure that every new product that we design is a, a step change improvement on the alternative that we're replacing. And that could be from energy efficiency, that could be from recyclability, greenhouse gas emissions. That's one of the things that we're trying to do. Lots of challenges, but they create lots of opportunities for innovation as, as, you're, as you've shown us. And uh, we'll be looking forward to watching the progress you make on your, your new commitments and, uh, and even some of the old ones. Jim Fitterling, CEO of Dow Chemical Company. Thank you so much, great to see you. Always great to see you, Joel. Thanks for having us and uh, always appreciate uh, sharing ideas with you.